we're on yours. You can use this one. Just this. Okay. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a real honor and a, and a privilege. Um, I uh, yeah, run the uh, CJ business uh, for Europe. I've been with the business for uh, about uh, six or seven months now, so I'm actually pretty new to CJ. Um, my, my life before CJ, I spent a long time ago, I was actually uh, in the banking industry. Uh, I survived the first uh, dot-com boom and bust, so I'm a real veteran in that respect. Uh, I did seven years at Orange, the mobile operator running their uh, platforms and their uh, uh, digital marketplace. Uh, I did four startups after that, uh, including the last one, Rightster, which did an IPO, floated on the uh, UK stock market uh, back in October last year. So I've seen uh, the good and the bad, um, and uh, my, yeah, my hair is going, my eyesight's uh, getting worse. Um, I'm going to just talk to you about three things today, um, and uh, I hope there's some value in there. I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about uh, what's been happening in the digital marketplace. I think a lot of that won't be news to you guys, um, but I think it's an interesting way of us just setting some context for, for the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, I also know that I need to talk a little bit about uh, CJ and Conversant and ADS, so I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes on that, what's been happening uh, in our business. Uh, and then I'm going to just try and touch a little bit on what's happening on the CJ roadmap. And I hope there's some stuff in there that will be of interest to you and happy to take some questions at the end of the session. Um, a little health warning. I have a habit of talking too fast and I'm talking in English. Uh, so when I start going fast, maybe if the front row could just give me the, the signal for slow down, I'll try and, uh, and try and make sure I do. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the digital landscape for a second. Um, as I said, some very well-known, uh, well-publicized stats, but worth setting the scene, I think. Uh, we know that the, the use of internet continues to grow, and really aggressively. What's interesting on here, I think, is that uh, in this stat, we see that more than half of all media is now being consumed online. So that's more than all of your TV, your radio, your newspaper. And I think that's a really impressive stat. It's more than every other media form combined. And what's also interesting is that of that, uh, more than a quarter of that is social networking, which... I don't know whether that's a good thing or a terrifying thing. It means that you guys are spending a lot of time on Facebook. And uh, you know, given my background at Orange, it's always interesting to look at what's happening in the mobile space. Um, it's really clear that mobile is uh, driving the changes here. 60% uh, of the world's population using a mobile device already. Uh, and nearly 40% of those are smartphones. Now, you think about how that stat has changed just in the last five years. It's a massive, massive change. It's a, a total paradigm shift. Um, the forecast by 2070 that we will be nearly at 50%. Huge number. And, you know, why, why is that changing so dramatically? Well, I think a big part of it is the penetration of 3 and 4G networks. So we know that that's bringing a uh, web connection to parts of the world which... Uh, getting a, a fixed line to was just never going to happen. And so it's effectively expanding the opportunity here to a whole new, a new audience. So a lot of internet usage, a lot of smartphones, one and a quarter billion expected to ship this year. And I think that's, you know, that's a huge number and uh, Samsung, Apple be, uh, will be pleased with the forecasts. And uh, it's also clear looking at the stats that that's not driving... A new acquisition with those numbers, um, it's driving both new and existing acquisition. And, you know, it really, it was really brought home to me the other day when uh, my eldest son moved to a secondary school. He started going to, to school on his own, which is, you know, if you're a parent, you'll know that suddenly seeing your child walk out the door, say goodbye and disappear off to school on his own is quite a big deal. And so we wanted to have him to have a, a phone so that we could keep in touch with him. And, uh, the obvious thing was to go down to the car phone warehouse to get him the cheapest handset to sign up to a network on, you know, on my credit card. But of course, I realized that actually in my drawer, I had an old Apple iPhone. In fact, I had two old Apple iPhones that I'd just done nothing with. And so I think like a lot of parents, I just gave him the phone. And, and so suddenly there is an 11-year-old boy who's using a smartphone. And he's never going to go back from that. He's, he's committed to using a smartphone forevermore from now on. Um, and I think that's interesting. It's good from my point of view. Last night I could say hi to him on FaceTime. 
Uh, it's also interesting that when I'm in meetings occasionally, because we're on the same account, I get a, a pop-up telling me that my sniper tower has been upgraded on Boom Beach. And maybe somebody later can tell me what that means, but clearly means that my son is playing games on his phone, not working. Um, Consumption, I think there was just an interesting stat in here, and I don't know whether this is a, an age thing, um, but the difference in news consumption between smartphones and tablets, there's a clear age differentiation here. Uh, my maybe slightly naive assumption is that uh, it's, it's an eyesight thing. I know now that, uh, that I start to move my devices further and further away so that I can see them, so I wonder maybe if uh, the propensity for uh, the older generation to use a, a tablet is simply about, about resolution. So, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the brand response piece here because I think that um, we hear a lot about the storytelling and the engagement uh, in brand marketing. Uh, we know that content has a really, really big part to play for many brands. Brands, it, It's about giving an audience something to engage with. Um, and that's uh, something we hear a lot about and it's something that's changing, but I think it's not changing fast enough. Um, we also hear a lot about data. Um, and I think there are two areas for me here. So. Uh, the, the first part of data is about measuring success, and I think we've all advanced our capabilities in that respect quite significantly over the last five years. Where I think the challenge still lies is about the actions that we drive from it. So turning our insights into different behaviors, into different marketing communications, and that's something I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. But certainly what it is doing is changing how we define success in the digital space. Uh, so it's no longer good enough to talk about the number of eyeballs that have seen your message. It's no longer good enough to not be able to make the connection between the brand communication you're making and the change in perception of your brand. The requirement for, for measurement and direct consequences is growing more and more. And of course, uh, if you work in the affiliate space, that's kind of a good thing because that's really what we've been about. It's about making those direct connections. So it kind of feels to me like the, the brand game is is starting to encroach on our space, but I think that's a good thing because inevitably the budgets follow. It's, um, it's certainly true as we get better at measurement and attribution that that, that blurred line happens. So we get a, a change between the separation of direct response and branding. Um, Interestingly, I read yesterday that, uh, that eMarketer has just changed the way that it defines uh, branding and direct response. Um, they're no longer defining direct response and branding uh, based on the ad formats. It's now about the marketing intention. And I think, again, that's, that's a realization that these two areas uh, can't be differentiated anymore simply by the format of an ad that you put up. I found this uh, chart online um, when I was preparing to come and talk to you guys, and uh, I kind of liked it. I'm not going to try and go into the detail of it because it'll take uh, uh, too long, but um, it's, the implication was that we are fundamentally having to change the way that, uh, that marketers work. And, and also, it, the thing that just struck me is that the headline on the papers when I, where I read this is that this is changing the way that some marketers work. And it just struck me that uh, of all the conversations that I've had over the last six months, that fundamentally every marketer is having to change the way that they work. And it kind of made me nervous because I was thinking, if it's only changing the way that some marketers work, what's everybody else doing? If these trends that we're seeing aren't changing the way that you work as a marketer, uh, then you've got a problem. Um, so lastly, um, uh, just a quick word on the big data piece. It's really relevant to what we're doing as a business. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of press, uh, and um, somebody gave me a slightly inappropriate analogy, which is that big data is a little bit like teenage sex in that um, everybody's talking about it, everybody thinks everybody else is doing it, and nobody actually knows what's going on at all. Um, from my point of view, uh, the difference is that two years ago, Big data was something that was talked about as a concept, and everybody got very excited, and everybody talked about their capabilities around acquisition of content. But as a business, it's important that we're evolving to focus on the actionable things that are to do with that data, rather than the acquisition of that data. It's more important to measure one or two things 
that really determine whether your campaign is successful, whether it's really impacting on your audience, rather than a drive to generically acquire data. Without the right range of measures, without the technology to deliver those messages, and without the identified audience to deliver those messages to, the data is kind of useless. So, as a, as a summary of that piece, the devices we use, the content that we consume, where, when, how we consume it, all changing really fast. And the advertisers are changing really fast too. Their goals and objectives, their methodologies, their level of sophistication changing really fast. And as I said, I'm, I'm seeing the boundaries between brand and performance marketing continue to blur. And that's a good thing for us because the more that those boundaries blur, the more that we have the opportunity to go to advertisers and talk to them about how they spend their brand budgets, to show them solutions that historically uh, they would have pigeonholed as a performance marketing solution only. So, I've got some pictures in here. I don't really know why they're in here. Um, I just put some nice pictures in. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what's been going on at CJ. Hopefully you've seen some stuff in the press. I don't know if we're, any of you were at De Mexico. Um, but uh, it's been a busy, a busy couple of months. So the first thing is that, um, that value click as a brand is no more. Um, the six companies that sat under the value click umbrella, that's Commission Junction, Datomi, Graystripe, MediaPlex, Set Media, and Value Click Media, uh, all now sit under the conversant brand. And uh, it was an overdue event, I think. Uh, more and more, we're needing to be able to talk to customers about integrated solutions uh, and presenting uh, siloed solutions under siloed brands really affects credibility in the long run. And I think importantly, given the journey here towards uh, a unified data set, uh, you can't credibly do that under separate brands. So this is really an in integral part of Conversant's journey from being a many to many, many to a dozen, uh, one to a, a dozen communication to being about personalization, about one to one. And this is one of the really key building blocks for us. Uh, a side note is that um, you'll see here, this is not an out-of-date brand, um, that of all of these, CJ is the business that retained its brand, although it moved from Commission Junction to CJ for a, a, defi a definition about which I'm not entirely clear. But certainly the, the thinking was that uh, CJ has uh, significant brand equity um, to some degree in Europe, but uh, very significantly in the US and that uh, there was a merit in retaining that as part of this rebrand. So whereas the other parts of the business are now just conversant, we're CJ by conversant, which is not very snappy. Um, so what's the point? Well, the first thing is that right now, CJ stroke conversant integrated platform is driving more than 5 million transactions a day. 5 million a day transactions going through Conversant's platform. And uh, again, apologies for the uh, slightly US-centric data here, but uh, Conversant's business uh, is serving three of the four uh, mobile carriers, seven of the top 10 car manufacturers, eight of the top 10 pharma companies, 51 of the top 100 retail brands, and 97 top global travel companies. So the that's not, uh, that's not a look at us, we're amazing. It's a, it's a sense of the volume of data that is, uh, that is being acquired by conversant. And you know, I'm slightly shooting my own argument in the foot here by talking about the volume of data. The value here is that what conversant is doing through its platform is building solutions that will allow us to action that data. As a, as a company, we invest more money in research and development than any other affiliate network. Um, currently working five languages, we pay out commissions in 16 currencies, we work in uh, 39 countries to do that. Um, interestingly, and uh, please don't um, challenge this stat too much, but the last read I had from Comscore was that conversance reaches second only to, to Google now globally, 86.1%. So what about CJ? So you'll know a little bit about CJ. Um, 
450 employees globally, 13 offices, and a huge number of advertisers and publishers. Uh, offices across Europe, uh, and obviously our long-standing uh, partnership with Viv Networks. Um, so, the summary value click is now conversant. Commission Junction is now CJ by conversant. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that five days after we rebranded, we announced that we were being sold to Alliance Data. So I think our marketing team would tell you that's the most successful rebrand ever. Um, they'd uh, point to the fact that it was entirely their work that the transaction uh, started in the first place. So uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't know anything about Alliance Data when uh, this announcement was made. Um, turns out they're a really big company, and I probably should have heard of them a little more. They're a US HQ multinational. Uh, they work across marketing, loyalty, and credit solutions. They have three key brands. Uh, so Alliance Data Retail, they provide branded credit programs. Uh, loyalty One, delivering loyalty and reward programs. And Epsilon are the number one globally for CRM and direct marketing solutions. And, you know, a so what number? They manage more than 100 million customer relationships globally. Uh, they have a $14 billion market cap. They bought Conversant at $35 a share. Uh, which was a 32% uh, premium on uh, Conversant's share price at the time. And again, it's a bit of a so what. I think how we took it at Conversant is that that is a massive endorsement of uh, the technologies and the solutions that Conversant have been building. Epsilon's business um, was a little bit like Conversant's business. They have invested a lot of money in trying to build the solutions that Conversant has engineered, trying to build uh, the data sets that Conversant has built. And I think this is a realization that actually uh, the best solution was buying Conversant rather than trying to compete with us. Um, and so I think it was a, you know, a huge endorsement. And the fact that the market, both boards, uh, agreed a share acquisition price uh, at that premium is, is, I think, a testimony to what the company's been building. Uh, nothing's done yet, all pending regulatory approval, but we expect that to happen in the next eight weeks or so. And, you know, frankly, from, you know, in terms of relevance to what I'm going to talk about now, the biggest thing is it's data again. It's a huge input of data into the conversant platform. Another random picture. In fact, I know why that one's there. We were in talking to to be Sky B a few weeks ago. And this is uh, one of the things that uh, sits in their network. So uh, I, I've talked a little bit about some stuff which is probably in the kind of quite nice but what's it mean to me category. Um, so I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit now about a couple of things that I hope will be more relevant. Um, we think we've built something really incredible here. And I say we, I, I had nothing to do with it, let's be clear. Um, and I am not uh, an engineer. I'm not in uh, product, uh, either in uh, product management or product marketing. And so uh, please um, be gentle with me on this stuff because uh, it's, not, uh, it's not entirely my area of expertise. Um, but, but the start point is the conversant personalization platform. And, and that is the, the combined platform from the six businesses that we integrated under the conversant brand. Um, and that's really about enabling that one-to-one -one marketing solution. Um, Four, four component parts here. So the first is the data and profiles, and that's what's built out of the data sets that existed in those six different businesses. They are now united in a single platform, millions of profiles, huge volumes of uh, insight and actionable data. So that allows us to start defining the correct message to sit alongside those profiles that will maximize the brand fit. And I think that's, that's where it starts to, starts to feel a little bit real. Um, the next piece is about connection, and that's about finding and delivering the right message in the right format, at the right time, to the right individual. And that's what the Conversant platform is able to do today. And of course, none of that really has merit without measurement. So the last piece of the platform, the, the fourth leg, if you like, uh, is the ability to provide really accurate measurements and genuine business intelligence. That is the, the promise of Conversant's platform as it sits today. So... Two, I made this slide. You can tell that uh, it's not as good as some of the other ones. Um, two things I wanted just to talk to you about very briefly. Affiliate customer insights, dynamic customer targeting, 
not very punchy uh, brand names, but two really important uh, things to talk about. So affiliate customer insights. Let's just talk about the problem for a second. So we've already talked about marketers' demand for better data, better understanding of their customers, the who, the when, the where, etc. Something that, frankly, as an industry, we've been pretty poor at. Um, we also know that there's a constant challenge to assess the relative merits of various different channels. And I'm sure that's something that, that you guys have either been challenged about or it's a question that you wrestle with yourselves. How do we demonstrate the value of the affiliate channel compared to alternative marketing solutions? It's really hard. Um, so the, the CJ solution is really the first time that you can properly connect data from publishers with data from advertisers uh, and data from the wider conversant network. And importantly, uh, it's about the connection of both online and offline data. Again, that's not easy. Um, but the, the value here is about really starting to be able to demonstrate to customers where affiliate fits into the value chain of marketing to really give them visibility into the effectiveness of the affiliate channel. Uh, and not just in how it drives transactions, but in how it acquires long-term customers and how it affects their offline behavior too. And think about that for a second. So it moves affiliate from here is the click that sent somebody to your site that drove a transaction. That's the game that we know. And it moves it into Here's how that person came back and bought again and again. And here's how that person came back and transacted with you outside of the digital environment. So I've got three, um, three quick reports just to share with you here before Vlad starts giving me the, the, the get off um, sign. Um, so the first one is channel insights. Um, and I'll just try and talk you through this very briefly. But effectively what we can see here is the initial transactions uh, unique customers, average order value um, that you would expect to see um, as part of a standard affiliate report. But we also see the repeat order behavior of those customers. Do they buy again? Do they come back and transact with us as a business again? What's the average order value of that transaction? Is it higher or lower? And let's be clear, there's no, uh, no guarantees that it'll be higher. But in the interests of uh, sharing data and in the interest of helping our customers run their business more effectively. That's a scenario that I think we've got to be comfortable with. So you see the initial value in the business, you see the initial value of the affiliate channel, but we also get quality measures of their lifetime value. Uh, secondly here, offline impact, and I mentioned this briefly earlier, but effectively by matching advertiser data with conversance data uh, and publisher data, we can identify customers who transacted offline. Now, you'll appreciate that this is a, uh, an enterprise-level solution that we're talking about at this stage, uh, and it requires some serious integration. But the fact is that our systems are the ones that can now make those connections on behalf of customers. They're providing us with data. We're able to demonstrate back to them how the affiliate channel is driving transactions offline. And you to file, and uh, this is probably something that, uh, again, you guys talk about a fair amount. How, how does the affiliate channel compare to others when it's acquiring new customers versus legacy customers? Um, I should point out that these, these numbers aren't real numbers, but the, the rates that you're seeing here are actually from the beta test that we've been running. So the, the uplift data is real data, but the $111 million dollars Sadly, isn't, maybe. So that's allowing us to answer the traditional challenges that affiliate businesses predominantly legacy customers. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, let's just talk about the how a little bit. Um, as a solution at this stage, this is something that's available to managed customers only. I, I think that will change. Um, but we are, as I said, in the very, very early stages of a rollout here. Um, criteria for how we provide this service and who we provide it to is partly based on uh, either the size and value of customer or a fee structure. And in terms of requirements, well, as I mentioned, this is an enterprise level solution. It's not something that we can roll out for everybody on day one. It does require the P pixel uh, integration for CJ's perspective. It requires 
cars the uh, conversant tracking tax, uh, and that's across every page of an advertiser site. It works in the same way as the Google Analytics tags um, with an integration that gives us entry point, exit point, actions on their website. Um, we also need uh, two years of historical online and offline data, uh, and we need on an ongoing basis buyer files, updated SKU records, etc. Um, and it also requires uh, the advertiser to agree to work with our data provider, Merkle Cog, um, who do all of the uh, data analysis and um, uh, anonymization of it. So um, a, a reasonably uh, lengthy integration process, but we went through it with Express. Uh, I'll talk about that again in a second. Uh, and actually, it was, it was something that didn't take a significant amount of development resource. Uh, oh, I've got an oof line via files. Um, and obviously, I think the, you know, one of the challenges here is about sharing personal data. The, the Merkle Cog solution is about uh, the anonymization of that data so that when we are making comparisons between conversance data records, publisher data, advertiser data, that is done at a one-to-one -one level but at an anonymized level. So there is no issue about sharing customer data from an advertiser's perspective. And secondly, I wanted to talk just a little bit about dynamic customer targeting. Another, another snappy slide that I put together. Um, and we skipped on to. That's because I'm not using the thing, isn't it, Vlad? I've broken it. Yeah. So it's doing a build, that's why. Oh, God. Um, we know that traditionally affiliate has been about delivering a, uh, a single message to an audience, a relatively untargeted audience, targeted generally by, by environment, to some extent a little bit by behavior, to some extent about being a self-selecting group. But predominantly it is a one-size-fits-all, one-message-to-all solution. So dynamic customer targeting gives us the ability to create these customer profiles down to the individual and then to dynamically deliver them a, uh, an affiliate message uh, based on that profile, based on their historical behavior. And so I think initially, you know, the obvious way you can see this starting to resonate with customers is around new versus existing customers. How do we send a different message to somebody that we've never met before as an advertiser versus somebody that we know now as a repeat customer? So by going through this integration, we're able to take that data and then take a whole series of customized marketing messages and deliver the appropriate message based on the profile that we're seeing of that person and to do that in real time. And there are a couple of different ways that we can do that. We can deliver the, the data, the different marketing creators and collateral uh, as files to our customer so that the publisher can continue to run that process for themselves or we can, can take control of the piece of real estate and we'll actually dynamically deliver those messages onto the customer page. So importantly, it remains in the customer's look and feel. They can have as much or as little control of it as, we, as they want. So I mentioned a beta. You can tell I didn't build the slide because it's got all these creative bits in it. Um, we ran this beta test with Express, who are a big online retailer in the US. Um, and this is just an example of that messaging based on us understanding whether the person that we are talking to on that page is a new customer or a legacy customer. And I would say that three years from now, this will look spectacularly unsophisticated. But today, it's something that is a new opportunity for us. So I don't really need to talk a little bit about how it works. I think we've talked about the integration piece. This is built off the same conversant platform. It's built off the same uh, enterprise level integration with advertisers, it still requires the tagging. Um, but the key aspects of it are that it allows us to utilize the data that's in Conversance Platform in its entirety rather than just the customer data. And that the, the actions, the insights, the strategy is presented to the customer by CJ. So we take the responsibility for for driving this away from the customer and do it on their behalf. And that's something that uh, really adds significant value, um, particularly for businesses that aren't resourced or uh, have the uh, infrastructure to support this. 
Um, we can talk about this uh, more outside if anybody wants to grab me, but there's just a few of the other things that are coming down the line. So the second phase of click path reporting, so insights into the publisher models and how they're contributing to conversion. Hopefully you've seen some data on the first phase of that. Uh, creative control, so some creative control around the coupon distribution piece. Um, uh, a fix around giving you daily balances, um, passing customer data files, and some custom data range stuff. And I'm not going to try and talk about these things, but I guess the message to you guys is um, that CJ Stroke Conversant are working really, really hard to innovate. We're working really, really hard to answer the challenges and the problems that we're addressing in the market. Um, and there is there's a lot happening. And I think that there's a there's a kind of hands up here because um, we've been pretty poor, I think, as a business in terms of. Uh, First of all, listening to what's happening in the European marketplace, and secondly, in terms of communicating to everybody what changes we're bringing, how to utilize those changes. Um, I think it's no secret that CJ three or four years ago, uh, with 67, 68% market share in the US, was a very, very US-centric business. And you can understand why. If you have a centralized product prioritization process, uh, the, the KPI that you use for prioritizing work is revenue. And if you've got 67% market share in the US, you know, there's not many things on a European roadmap that are going to knock those off in terms of showing value for money. And it's a, it's a naive way of running a process, but it's how it happened. Um, what's, of course, interesting now is that to go from 67% to 75% market share in the US is really, really hard. I mean, really hard. And so when you're looking for growth in CJ, you're not looking for it in the US anymore. You're looking for it externally. And so there's a kind of Damascene moment when their eyes raise from, from their own navels and recognize that actually Europe is, uh, is the opportunity. And so for the first time uh, as a business, we have dedicated product development streams uh, servicing the European requirements. We have dedicated product uh, marketing functions to help communicate about those changes. And so what I really hope is for you guys here, over the next six months, you'll start to see a really material difference in A, the velocity that we bring innovation, uh, B, in the fact that we are responding to European challenges, not to US challenges. And I mean, don't get me started on the whole issue about invoicing because it's a concept that the US market is not familiar with. We know here that it's a massive challenge for how we uh, settle with publishers. And so there is a realization that these things need to be addressed. So as I said, we should be innovating more quickly. We should be innovating to suit European needs. And we should be doing a much, much better job of telling you guys about what's coming, about what's been launched, and about how to use those solutions. And I think that piece is really, really important. I think the US uh, product marketing function kind of got into the habit of releasing stuff and then saying, there you go, go and play. Uh, and there's a recognition now that that just doesn't work. So we're going to see that change. And uh, so the last slide I put up here was around localization. Uh, the spell checker keeps trying to put a Z in that, but um, from my perspective, we say, spell it with an S. Um, so uh, Vlad and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, it's something that uh, he, he beats me up about quite rightly, because frankly, as a global business, it sucks that we don't support local languages. And the good news is that we're going to. And not next year, the year after, but we're working on this right now. So we're really hoping to be able to bring some progress on this before the end of the year. So there'll be some challenges around what we prioritize. Uh, we're looking at, obviously, localization of the website itself, of the member center, of all of the help center content. And actually, when you start to break it down like that, there's a lot of stuff out there. But the fact is that we're working on it. We'll be working with, uh, with the Viv team to really deliver something of value to you guys, and hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, that's it from me. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Am I all right? Yeah, that's fine. Sure. He, did, he didn't say that very quickly, did he? Um, if anybody has any questions, is this a good moment to do that? Tak je prostor pro otázky. This hasn't been working at all, has it? No. I've been holding this the whole time and it's not been working. It's lucky I've got a loud one. Tak je prostor pro otázky, jestli někdo má k tomu, co Charles nám zde prezentoval. Ne, všechno bylo jasné. Tak poděkujeme Charlesovi.
Thank you very much, Charles.